Our scripture reading today comes from Luke 9, verses 1 through 9. So I will read that. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever, you do, and wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning, and I thank you again, God, that you reign above it all, that you reign above every heart. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us and help us to understand your word and be with Pastor Todd as he delivers your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. If you recall, uh, Jesus has, uh, we, we looked at actually four miracles over the last several weeks that Jesus performed. Um, in rather small settings, it was largely these miracles were in the settings where just the disciples and maybe one or two other people were there. Think about the miracle on the sea of Galilee where he calmed the wind and the waves. It's just the disciples in the boat. And think about when he uh, gets to the western, uh, or the eastern shore, uh, rather, of uh, the Sea of Galilee, at the, uh, and, and he, he cast out the demon, you know, the man that had 5,000, a legion of demons, 5,000 demons. And uh, there's not many people around, not a big crowd has gathered. So a lot of these miracles have been sort of private instructions in some ways for the disciples. Uh, and now, when we get to Luke chapter 9, the disciples are actually going to go out and do similar things to what Jesus has been doing. Jesus has been preaching and performing miracles, and now he will send off the 12 to do the same thing uh, in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 9. This is the first of the sending of the disciples. There's going to be another one in chapter 10. Uh, they're going to be similar in terms of the instructions that the disciples are given. The difference will be in, in chapter 10, it'll be 72 will be sent out. It'll be a, a bigger number. But this is the first of these where the 12 will be, uh, the, send, will be the ones that will be sent out. I teach uh, just one class at this small uh, seminary, Metro Baltimore Seminary, where you know, we, I think we have 10% of the student body in this, uh, just from our church going to this uh, school. But that's fine, that's good. And, uh, but part of the program is you, 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 know, you get an educational piece, you have to go to classes on uh, Tuesday nights for three hours or whatever it is. But another part of that instruction is you have to do what we call a practicum. In other words, the student has to teach so many times and the student has to visit so many sick people and serve in, in their church in so many ways. They have to do lots of things and they get credit for doing those things. That's part of the instruction because the idea is that you don't just take in knowledge, you have to take in knowledge and then dispel knowledge and in both of those processes, you learn. And so there's this big component to an MBS degree uh, that has to do with practical, experiential going out and doing the things. And in many ways, it models what Jesus did with the, with the disciples. He doesn't just show them. He doesn't just teach them. He actually will send them into the world uh, uh, to, get, to get a feel of, uh, to help them to learn what it is they need to learn. And ultimately, this will be their objective, right? At the end of, the, the of Jesus' ministry, he will send them out uh, into the world. 
Now, I was um, looking at this text and trying to come up with a fancy outline and basically gave up. Uh, and, and so what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to give you five points that I wanted to emphasize from this text uh, this morning. And, and, and they have to do with the message, the messenger, and the, mess, and the, uh, the, the master himself. So you could put them into one of those categories if you want. But there's, here's, here, these are five uh, principles that I think we could take and observations we can see from this text. The first is this, that the goal of the disciples was to share information they had already received. It was to share information they had received. Look at verses 1, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over demons, and he sent them out to proclaim. Uh, he called them together. The word there for called has to do with calling a specific group of people together for a particular purpose. Uh, we are called together this morning for the purpose of the worshiping of, of the Lord our God. Uh, you might get called into a meeting at work for a, to solve a particular problem, to address a particular issue. Uh, the, the, the nature of being called is to be called together for a purpose. So, that's the, so he's, he's calling them. Now, he's not calling everybody. He's just calling at this particular moment. He's calling the 12 and gathering them together. And then he's going to send them out in verse 2, and he sent them. Now, this word is apostoleo. That's the, the verb form of it. It's where we get our word apostle from. Apostle is simply the uh, noun. The verb is uh, apostoleo. A and both of the words, they literally mean, the apostle is simply a word that means someone who is sent, the sent ones. And so the apostles are people who are being sent out. And it's a little bit distinct from calling them disciples because Jesus has many disciples, but he only has, but there's only a select number of them that become apostles that are being sent out. So sometimes we confuse the, uh, sometimes we confuse the issue, but the language here is clear. These disciples are coming to Jesus to be apostles, to be ones who are sent out. In particular, it doesn't say it in the text, but it's clear from other texts that he's sending them out to the region of Galilee and to the, the, the Jews. He's, they're not going to the Gentiles quite yet. They're, they're just going local, they're going to the nation of Israel, uh, and that's their purpose. Now, you might say to yourself, if we were to ask the question, what is a disciple? You might say to yourself, that a disciple is a person who learns certain truths uh, in order to make their life better, right? But Jesus is taking it one step further. And it is true that a disciple is a person who learns from a master, who learns certain truths or principles so that their lives will be better. But Jesus is saying a disciple is also a person who takes that knowledge so that others' lives will be better, so that the world, in fact, will be a better place. So the point is that the disciple is not simply to take the information that he learns, keep it to himself. He's to take the information he learns and disseminate it broadly. And this is evidently is a bit unique. It, this doesn't seem to be the, the case of most rabbis, particularly Jewish rabbis in Jesus' day. They, didn't, they had disciples that, that surrounded them and they taught them, but the, the and then those disciples, I guess they would teach others, but they weren't sent broadly in, across the world like Jesus is doing. Jesus wants to transform not simply the disciples, but others. Now, this may seem like burdensome. It may seem like, well, that just adds another layer of complexity onto life. But think about what a great privilege it is to communicate the most important truth in the world. I mean, if you, if you discover something that's interesting, if you come across a fascinating fact, for example, don't you like to share that and just, in some ways you want to share it to tell people what a smart person you are, but in other ways you want to share it because good news by its nature needs to be shared. So think of what a privilege it is that these disciples have to take what they've learned from Jesus and to share it with those around them. The goal of the disciples was to share the information that they had received. All right, and, and by the way, this is going to apply to us as well, not 
and there, there'll, there'll be applications that will be similar to us. There'll be, there'll be things that will be different. But generally speaking, when Jesus calls us to follow him, he calls us to follow him so our lives will be better. But he also calls us to follow him so that others' lives will be better. And when you look at the testimony of the church throughout the ages, the church has provided, advan has provided significant advancements into the world because they care about other people. They care about getting the message out broadly. All right, here's the second point. The second point is that the disciples were enabled for their task by the power of God. And he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. The disciples did not call themselves together. Jesus called them together. And once, he call, and once he calls them together, he then enables them to do the thing that he's going to call them to do. He's going to call them to preach, and he's going to call them to perform miracles. Sometimes we, I think sometimes we miss this. And by the way, you're going to need to keep this in the back of your mind because we're going to come up to some instances later where the disciples have struggle with performing miracles. But in this particular instance... Uh, they're given the, the ability to perform miracles. And we, we sort of miss that a little bit. We know Jesus can do miracles, but now Jesus's authority is such that he can, he, can, he can pass that authority and that power onto his disciples, which is the ultimate, po the ultimate picture of authority, right? It's one thing if you can do something, but if you can, if you can enable somebody else to do that thing, then all of a sudden it's, it's a whole different Ball game. So that's what he's doing. He's enabling the disciples with power and authority to, to cast out demons, to perform healings, to perform miracles, and to preach uh, the good news of the gospel. Um, Jesus' authority has been prominent throughout the gospels of, of Luke that we've looked at. And we see it demonstrated everywhere. We see it demonst We saw it demonstrated uh, last a week when he cast out uh, the man that had thousands of demons, the legion of demons. And and as soon as Jesus gets to the shore, uh, if you look at eight verse twenty eight, uh, what does it say? It says when he when when he saw this is the man who was demon possessed, Jesus he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice. What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. I, he, the demon acts like Jesus is in authority. The demon acts like he has to submit to Jesus' word, and he does. And Jesus is going to take that authority and give it to the disciples. Now, there's another way uh, Jesus en enables and empowers uh, the disciples as well. First is he gives them his authority and he gives them power. But notice um, a little bit later on, he helps the disciples understand that even in the most simple of, of tasks, they're going to be dependent on him. There's a, there's a whole interesting thing here in verses 3 to 4 where he says to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there, uh, depart. Now, there's a big debate among scholars as to why these five things are listed that they're, not, that they're prohibited to do. They can't take a staff, a bag, they can't take bread, they can't take money, uh, and they can't take an extra tunic. They can have one tunic, they just can't take two uh, tunics. I don't, I don't know how you travel. We have, we have friends that when uh, they traveled, when they travel, they like take as many suitcases as they can possibly pack. I mean, we, we were going to rent it. We went, we were going on a trip and these friends were going to be with us. And we were thinking about renting a car. I was thinking about, oh, we could rent a, get off the airplane, rent a car together. We could share a car. Right. And, and then when they told me how much luggage they were taking, it was like, there's no way. We're sure we can't even, they can barely get all of their luggage in a car <laughs> that they're going to rent. Now, we, when we travel, we try to, we, we travel light. We went, we went to China for a couple of weeks, and everything that we traveled with, 
would, was on our backpacks. So we, we travel as light as we possibly can, and that seems to be what Jesus is, is making the point here. They're, the disciples are to travel light. They're not to take six or seven bags with them wherever they go, They're not to take extra things. And the question is, why is that? And there's a number of different explanations that have offered, because Jesus doesn't tell us. He just tells them what to do. It doesn't tell them why. But one reason may be because the the urgency of the journey, of the urgency of the message. The message has to get out there. You have to be nimble on your feet. You have to be quick. You can't be bogged down figuring out how you're going to get all your bags to the next place. And so as a result, you need to travel light. But there's another reason, and I think this is more likely, why he told them to travel light. It may simply be that he is teaching the disciples to depend on him even for the most basic necessities of the journey. See, they were going to depend on him for the power to preach and perform miracles, but they're also going to depend on him to provide the basic things that they need, food, clothing, security, safety, protection, all of the things you need when you go on a journey. There was going to be a supernatural need, to perform healings, but there was going to be a very natural need, food and clothing, and Jesus was going to provide both. Even in verse 4, it suggests something very interesting. It suggests that they not even seek better lodging if it becomes available. That seems to be what means that when you enter a house, stay there and from there depart. So they go to a city uh, they meet some hospitable stranger in the city. The stranger says, you can stay at our house. Their house, though, isn't very big, doesn't have much luxuries, doesn't have extra, you know, there's no extra bathrooms, there's no extra uh, beds, there's no, it's, it's just very minimal, very realistic. And imagine uh, they're there for a couple of days and they meet somebody else who has a better house. It's a bigger house. It has more room. It has more, more conveniences in it. And Jesus says, you don't go to the better house. Because the point is not for you to be comfortable. The point is for you to communicate the message and to do the things that I've called you to do. Don't seek the comforts of this life when you're ministering to people with the gospels, what he he appears to be saying. Now, just in case you're wondering about the application, does this mean ministers should not get paid? Some of you probably think that'd be a good idea. We'd, we'd have, you know, the, the ministers should not get paid, missionaries should not get paid. But th- this is not a, one of those universal applications that applies to every minister or every person. And the reason you know that, it will apply to the people in chapter 10, the 72. But later on in Luke 22, Jesus will say just the opposite. He says, but now the one who has a money bag, take it and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. And In other words, the situation he's addressing in Luke 22 is different than the situation in Luke 9, and he's saying in that situation, you need to prepare for the journey. You need to take extra tunic. You need to take money back. You need to take this, and you need to take this. So it's not a universal application. It's an application for these early disciples to learn to depend upon God in every way. And that's a principle that applies broadly uh, to all of us as well. That we need to learn that if when God calls us to do something, he enables us, first of all, with the power to do it. And secondly, he enables us with even the natural things, the needs that he meets our needs in doing it. If, um, you know, one of the extraordinary things, when I, when I went, started seminary, and how long ago was that, 24? Four years ago, I guess it was, I started seminary, and I, did, I didn't even have, I didn't have a job at the time, and we're paying for seminary, and we're, you know, putting out, and I'm still not really working anything that, did, that makes any substantial income, and you sort of wondered, you know, even back then, seminary was expensive, it wasn't near as cheap as Metro Baltimore, I'll tell you that, seminary was expensive, and yet, after three years of going to seminary, I, looked, I remember looking at my bank account one day and saying, you know, that number's the same as it was three years ago. Where, how did I get, <laughs> how did we get, how did we afford to go through? And, you know, there's, that's what God does. You see, when he, when he calls you to do something, 
he, he makes it possible for that to happen. And if it isn't possible for that to happen, maybe it means God isn't calling you. I've known lots of people say, God is calling me to the mission field, and then they start raising support, and nobody wants to support them. It's probably because God hasn't called you to the mission field. You think he's called you, but he probably hasn't. Every missionary that I know that God has called to the mission field, God has provided the means for them to go to the mission field. And anything, and this is going to be true for the disciples, they're going to learn this message early on, and that principle is going to carry them through to the rest of their lives. So the, the goal of the disciples was to share the information that they had been given to the world. And the disciples were enabled to do this by the power of God, by the enabling of God. Here's the third principle. The message of the disciples was one both of word and of deed. What does it say in verse 2? And he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now, they're similar things but they're different. One is proclamation. One is using words. They're speaking, they're preaching, um, they're telling what they've heard. Uh, they're, te- they're going to these cities and they're saying with their mouth, the time we have been waiting for has arrived. God has come to take back his fallen creation. God has come to restore the nation of Israel. God has come to establish his kingdom on earth. And we know this because the king has come. So they're proclaiming a message of the kingdom of God, that God has sent his son, his king, into the world to announce the coming of the kingdom. And all of this problem that we've seen with sin and all this problem that we've seen with rebellion and all this problem we've seen with death and decay and all sorts of other things are now going to be reversed when the king comes into the world because that's what the Old Testament prophesied. So they're preaching that message. But they're also to heal. That's the second part of it, right? And the healings of the sick proved that the reversal, the great reversal of the kingdom was in fact taking place. Sickness and disease is a result of the curse. It's a result of sin into the world. And what the disciples proclaimed when they healed somebody was that the kingdom will usher in the great reversal. Disease will be done away with. Sickness will eventually be done away with. Death will be done away with. So the miracles were the illustration of the sermon. You know, they tell you in seminary when you preach a sermon, you ought to also have illustrations. You have to, 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 to paint the picture for people. And this is true. Most, most of you will be able to, if there's an illustration or a story or something I tell in the sermon, most of you will remember the story. You, you will never remember the three points or the five points or whatever, unless you wrote them down and memorized it. But you'll remember the stories. You'll remember the illustrations. So it was going to be true in Jesus' day. The disciples were going to heal people, and people will not forget the healings. They might forget the exact words that were spoken, but the healings are going to be embedded because they illustrate the reality of what the disciples are preaching. And then according to verse 6, that's what they did, and that's what happened. They departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So they did exactly what Jesus called them to do. They become preachers and they become healers in communicating the gospel. They accomplished the goal. Now the application, of course, to us is that is very similar. That the preaching of the gospel must always be occupied with, with an action. There, there, there are words that need to be spoken. In fact, in Romans 10, Uh, Paul will say, how will they call on him they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching, without someone proclaiming the truth? So the gospel by its nature is is, is something that needs to be proclaimed by words. But if you proclaim a truth by words but don't illustrate it, your words aren't going to be very effective. You can't preach forgiveness if you don't show people what forgiveness looks like, if you're not able to forgive people. You you can't preach peace 
if you yourself are not at peace, if you can't illustrate peace and just in the very way you live your life. You can't say God loves you with your, with your mouth if you don't show others what love looks like. You, you need to demonstrate love in tangible ways that people can see and say, oh, now I get what you mean when you say God loves me. There's, um, there's a quote that often gets missed. Well, there's a misquote uh, from St. Francis of Assisi. You may have heard preachers use this. And the, the quote is that Frank, St. Francis purportedly said that you should preach the gospel often and when necessary, use words. And the, and the idea is that you really don't need words to preach the gospel. Well, here's a, here's a little secret. St. Francis never said that. In fact, St. Francis would have said just the opposite of that because St. Francis was a dynamic preacher. He was like Billy Sunday, you know, or he was like Spurgeon, or he was like one of the great preachers. He was very dynamic. He, and, and the point that he was trying to get across the, it, it was that you, you, you have to preach the gospel. You just can't preach the gospel. You also have to live the gospel. You also have to illustrate it. And he gets misquoted and turned around and turned upside down. Because the opposite is true. You need both. You need the gospel of proclamation, but you also need the gospel of demonstration. And that was the role of the, that was the goal of the disciples. We're going to proclaim the truth, but by performing these miracles, we're also going to demonstrate the truth. Here's the fourth principle. The fourth principle is this, that the message of the disciples was prophetic and had serious implications for its hearers, for those who would listen to this proclamation. Because look at what verse five says. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. It, is, it was said that in Jesus' day that when a Jew returned home from traveling to Gentile territory, that he would brush the dust from his garment and from his feet before he went back to Israel. Israel was the holy land and the land of the Gentiles was the unholy land. So when the Jew came back, he wanted to get as much unholy dust off of him as he could. He didn't want to contaminate the holy land, so to speak. It may be that Jesus is playing on this idea a little bit, but what he's saying is, in rejecting the message of the kingdom of God, the town is bringing judgment on itself. The dust of rejection is to be left on them before you go to the next town. In other words, they're like the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets would, would preach the word of God to God's people and sometimes they would heed it. For example, like they did in Nineveh when Jonah preached, they all repented and then God didn't bring judgment. But sometimes they wouldn't heed it, like when Jeremiah preached to the Jews in Jerusalem about the coming invasion from Babylon, and they paid no attention to him. And as a result, judgment came. Babylon invaded. Jerusalem was destroyed. The people were carried into captivity. And the, the lack of response, the failure to believe, was, was the judgment of God, resulted in the judgment of God on them. You see, to reject the message of salvation in Christ is to heap judgment on yourself. If, if I told you that a storm was coming and, and there was a shelter that's made out of concrete and it's reinforced and it's strong, and if, if you get into the shelter, you will be saved. But if you stay out in the storm, you're going to die. And you said, well, I don't believe you, or I don't believe the shelter is very strong, and I believe it, or whatever, and you, you don't come into the shelter with me, and you die, your death is on you. Or that's your responsibility, that you have, brought, you have brought the condemnation of your decisions. The gospel calls people, the good news that these, these disciples would eventually preach was that the gospel calls people to escape the judgment of God by turning to Christ. We tell people that you don't have to face the judgment of God. You can simply put your faith in the Lord Jesus who faced the judgment of God. He faced it on the cross. 
He atones for sin on the cross. He takes your judgment on the cross. And if you entrust, if you trust him, you will be saved from the judgment of God. But if you say to me, well, I don't know about Jesus. I don't know if he was a real person. I don't really know if he was the son of God. I don't trust this. I don't trust that. And besides that, I'm a good person anyway. It doesn't really matter. I, I, even if I do stand before God in judgment day, I've done enough good things on this hand that I'm sure they'll balance. I'm just sure they'll balance out on the other hand, all the bad things. But when you stand before God and he pronounces judgment, you, you have no one to, to blame but yourself. There are consequences, in other words, of rejecting the message of the gospel. There were consequences in Jesus' day, but there are always consequences in our day as well for those of us who reject the message. The message of the disciples then was prophetic. It was like they were the Old Testament prophets, and it had serious implications if the message was rejected. Here's the fifth point then. The question that everyone must answer then, in response to this message actually, is this. Who is Jesus? Now, that's why I think the writer, like Luke, included verses seven to nine. This little account of Herod. Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening and he was perplexed. He was questioning. He wasn't quite sure. Verse 9, John I beheaded, he says, but who is this about whom I hear such things? Who is this person, Jesus? And that's a, a really good question. Herod, this is Herod Antipas, by the way. He is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the ruler when Jesus was born. But when he died, he passed off his kingdom to three of his sons. And Herod Antipas inherits Galilee, also Perea, but he inherits Galilee. So Jesus's ministry is fundamentally out of Galilee. And so Herod knows what's going on. He knows pretty much everything's going on in Galilee. And he hears stories about Jesus. And now he's curious. He's perplexed. He asks a question. And there's three ideas that are presented before him. One is, well, this is John the Baptist who's come back from the dead. Herod had executed John. He'd cut off his head as a result of uh, some prodding by his wife, Herodias. John, uh, Luke doesn't tell us the details. The other gospel writers, Luke assumes we know. The other gospel writers tell us the details about how Herod beheaded John because John had criticized his uh, immoral marriage to Herodias. He basically dumped his wife to marry Herodias, his brother's wife, and John was saying that's sinful, and Herod didn't like it. Herodias really didn't like it, and eventually John gets beheaded. So maybe he's saying the superstitious people were saying, maybe this is John come back from the dead. Other people are saying he's Elijah, now you hear this a lot in the New Testament. Why would people say that Jesus was Elijah? Well, there's two reasons. One is Elijah was one of the Old Testament characters that did not die. He was taken up in a whirlwind in 2 Kings chapter two. But the other reason is because in Malachi four, the, the promise of the prophet is at the very end of the book, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, Malachi four, five. So people say, all right, this is Elijah. This is the way, because he's doing miracles like Elijah did, that's for sure. So maybe it's Elijah, the one that's promised to come. Or maybe he's one of the prophets come back from the dead. A great prophet had not been in the nation of Israel for 400 years. That's a long time to go with, for, the, for the nation to go without a great prophet. So people are saying maybe it's finally time. One of these great Old Testament prophets had come back from the dead. Now the problem with Herod's three choices are this, what's missing? What's missing is the real answer to the question. What's missing is, well, maybe Jesus is the Messiah. <laughs> maybe he's the promised king of Israel. Maybe he's the savior of the world. Maybe he's Lord. Maybe he's God. Herod is curious. He's perplexed. But if he was paying attention, he might have heard the right answer. Had he heard the message of the disciples, he might have understood who Jesus was. 
and what Jesus came to do. That he was indeed the Son of God, that he was indeed the promised Messiah, that he was indeed ushering in the kingdom of God, that he was indeed fulfilling all of the Old Testament prophecies regarding the coming king. And then maybe would have, Herod would have had a fourth choice. Herod is curious, but it doesn't go beyond curiosity. Throughout Luke, this question is constantly being raised. Who is Jesus? Actually, we last saw the disciples raise it in, in uh, Luke 8, 25, when, when they said, uh, who is this that he commands even winds and water to obey him? In Luke, uh, l later on, uh, when Jesus cast out the demons and the people went out to see what happened and they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed in his right mind and they were afraid because they couldn't figure out who Jesus was. In other places it will be Jesus who forgives. Who is this who forgives sins? Who is this that has such authority whose word carries such power and such authority? Who is this that speaks to demons and they flee him? Who casts out demons? Who raises the dead? Who cures diseases? Who speaks of a kingdom? Who forgives sins? Who promises eternal life? Who is this? Who is this indeed? These are either the words of a delusional man or they're the words of God himself. And if they're the words of God himself, then we better pay attention to them or face the consequences of God's judgment. The disciples were to share the information they had been given. They were enabled by the power of God to do so. And they shared that information in both in word and deed. They shared that in power and in authority so that everyone heard and everyone knew who Jesus was the King, the Lord, the Savior. Do you know this Jesus this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great witness, these men who bore witness to the truth, and as a result, we now know who Jesus is. May we be like them in that regard. May we bear witness to the truth. May people see Christ in us. And may their lives be transformed by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.